evening or good afternoon, everybody. This is Andrea Copping at PNNL. I'm hoping everyone hears me all right. We have quite a number of people on the line. Our Scottish colleagues I'm not seeing right now, though we do have a couple of anonymous people. Um, so today we are going to talk a little bit about monitoring around tidal and wave arrays. I'd like to first go around uh, the lines and have people introduce themselves just so we know who we've got here. And then today I have put together a series of questions that I'm hoping are just going to sort of start us off and get us thinking about some of these um, issues around arrays. Again, unfortunately, we had a couple of last minute cancellations, including Carol Sparling of SMRU, who had, who had quite a, a sort of a thought process going that I'll try to um, uh, represent a little bit. Um, so again, Andrea Copping, uh, why don't we go ahead um, on the line? Garrett Staines at Pacific Northwest National Lab at the Marine Sciences Laboratory in Squim. Jennifer Harker-Klimash at PNNL, um, also in Seattle with Andrea. This is John Horn. I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle. This is Sherry Matner. I'm an engineer at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Squim. This is Caitlin Long from the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney. Hi, it's Chris Tomachek. I'm with Clancher Associates in Connecticut. Hi, this is Jeff Beezer. I'm uh, with NOAA Fisheries Office of Science and Technology in Silver Spring. Melissa Aldridge with Force in Canada. And Nate Johnson from Ocean Renewable Power Company in Portland, Maine. Gail Zedleski, University of Maine. Jason Wood, SMRU Consulting in Friday Harbor, Washington. Samantha Hughes from the U.S. Department of Energy. And I see someone from Aquaterra on the line. And that looks like most people. Okay, well... If anybody wants to jump in, we have 20 people all together, apparently. Uh, and this is great. So thank you for joining us today. Do you want to go to the next slide, please, Amy? Um, you'll recall the last time many of us got together, we were talking about sort of standardization of how we ought to go about monitoring around uh, uh, marine renewable energy devices. We've talked a lot about tidal. I think we want to keep in mind that Although we don't have much in the way of wave devices in the water in many nations, we are moving towards that and moving towards wave arrays. So keeping in the back of our mind that a lot of what we think about around tidal is equally applicable around wave, while other parts simply aren't, particularly associated with collision risk. Um, and I've put some uh, slides together here just so we can sort of be on the same page to start in terms of context that we continue, obviously, to have limited monitoring of animal interactions around single devices, obviously even less about array around arrays. In fact, if we look at the sum total of array monitoring that I am aware of, it uh, there was some done at the Wright Project, the Roosevelt Island Tidal Energy Project in the New York um, River, uh, Hudson River, or the East River, rather. And, uh, by East River. East River, yeah, thank you around uh, the verdant turbines several years ago. And we know that there is uh, uh, active monitoring now going on around Mayjan. I was reminded by Beth Scott at the University of Aberdeen yesterday that they had done some work around the uh, Mayjan area previous to uh, the new equipment going in as well. And I don't know if Benjamin Williamson, I thought was going to be on the line, I'm not sure he is, tell us a little bit about that. Um, uh, but there really hasn't been very much in the way of array monitoring to date, and certainly not around wave arrays. So next slide, please, Amy. So some of the questions that dawned on me, and I've had some back and forth with a number of people, is really where we left off last time. We're starting to understand how to monitor, um, particularly animal, animal interaction around tidal devices. But what does this mean in terms of arrays? Can we monitor around a single turbine, which is the situation that is set up in uh, at Majin, where there is 
considerable instrumentation around one turbine in the array. Can we look at one turbine and say something about arrays? Um, and where Carol Sparling particularly wanted to go today, I know, was really the need to talk about the scale of arrays we're talking about. Are we just talking about two, three, four, five machines? Or are we trying to think ahead to when there might be tens to perhaps even hundreds of machines in the water? Um, and this really brings this third question into, into uh, focus. What do we think the trajectory of development is likely to look like? Will it continue at a fairly slow ramp-up pace where uh, the twos and threes and fours of turbines or wax are permitted, consented, and go in the water? Or do we think sometime in the foreseeable future there could be a real step function, a real increase to large arrays? And our thinking about how to understand potential risk to animals, perhaps habitats, um, be changed depending on what that, what that um, kind of scale looks like. So what I'd like to do is just kind of throw it open to thoughts from anyone about this sort of set of questions. Um, how do we think about monitoring around a single device, what that tells us about arrays, and how does this thinking get further developed or changed based on how big an array we might be talking about? So please, any thoughts, just Go ahead, you may, might want to introduce yourself as you speak, just so we can all kind of be on the same page. Andrea, this is Dale Zedleski, uh, yeah. you mean. Um, yeah. I think that another piece of the scale issue is what um, what scale of interaction are we talking about? So there's the scale of how many devices will be in an array, but is it that we want to talk about interactions directly with the turbine or within the scale of medium to far field. So I don't know if that is mix in with, mixes in with what you just said, but I perceived what you said a little differently. Gail, absolutely good point. The scale issue has to deal, has to look at several different factors. One is, yeah, how many machines are we talking about? But you're absolutely right. Are we trying to continue to look as, as we have at tidal arrays what's happening, or tidal devices, what's happening really up close, the sort of the collision encounter issue versus the broader, um, perhaps avoidance or attraction kind of issue. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Sorry, I hesitate to unmute because I have my puppy with me. <laughs> Sorry. Stop on that. Anyone? Sorry, Andrea, it's Ian here at um, Aquaterra. Just to build on what, what Gail said there, there's, a, there's another strand yet um, to scale, um, and that's actually the, the size and type of devices. I think we're seeing a number of developers now focusing on using smaller turbines, even across large arrays. So I think we need to be thinking, um, you know, not everybody's going to shoot for these large machines. So it's just another factor of scale I think we need to consider in, in this discussion. Very good point, Ian. Uh, just a little clarification there. Um, I think that that we're all very aware how scalable devices are. When you're when you say that you think developers are likely to go to small, or some of them will look at smaller machines. Will that be strictly for smaller applications, say small, say you know community uh, or do you think that we will start to see more smaller devices? Hey, I think both. Um, I think we're looking at um, some developers looking to aggregate a number of smaller rotors on single structures. So that could possibly become, you know, quite large projects in terms of install capacity uh, as well. So I think we're going to see quite a mixture going forward. Great, thank you. Other thoughts? Andrea, this is John Horn. Before we get too far in. I would suggest that we might even compare and contrast our perceptions of our definition of scale and how it applies to uh, marine renewable sites. When I think of scale, there are two primary components, the resolution, meaning the grain size, and the range or the domain. If we're talking about single devices, and Gail has already used near field and far field, what does that represent in people's minds? In comparison, if we are going up to commercial sites and arrays, have we jumped how many orders of magnitude 
in the resolution that we need to look at things, does it remain the same, and how big does the range get? As an example, if I think of a around a single device and monitoring at a single device, I'm going from, what, tens to hundreds of meters, and when I go to a commercial site, I'm starting to think about square kilometers or square tens of kilometers as order of magnitude, and that might actually change what tools we use um, and how we analyze the data. So I'd be very interested to just really quickly kind of get a sense of, of orders of magnitude for those two types of scenarios for monitoring. You raise an incredibly good point, John, and I think that this is exactly the issue um, if you are talking about arrays and tens of kilometers, I think most of us assume this is going to be a very difficult thing to have any very meaningful monitoring over that scale, which I think is part of the, the whole idea. Can you get a good sense of these sort of interactions, say, at a single device scale? So you're down to more like tens of meters. Um, and then meaningfully extrapolate those kinds of processes or interactions to the larger scale. What do, what do others think? Do we think that, that we may ever be truly able to look at full-size arrays, as John says, tens of kilometers, in a meaningful way? Um, I, I guess uh, I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer that, Andrea. This is Jason Wood, um, but um, I'm uh, in terms of the discussion of scale. You know, we we focused on the spatial aspects of it, but I, I think we also need to um, remind ourselves of the of the temporal aspect as well uh, in in terms of monitoring. Um, uh, you know, especially you know as we try to go out to uh, you know array size um, things, it's it's going to be. It's going to be harder to uh, cover things both spatially and temporally, especially if we've got, say, data mortgages and stuff. One of the easiest things to do is, right, is to, is to, uh, you know, only sample occasionally in in the in the time domain, and um, that has implications on whether or not we can answer some of the questions that we're trying to answer. Really good point, Jason. So, what's the what's the path forward for that? Because uh, we, we're we've just talked about extreme potential extremes of two scales spatial and temporal and in the in the perfect world we would be monitoring every machine at close and slightly further field distance 24 7 and I think we probably all believe that's just not doable on a sustained basis so what's what's the answer what's what's a path forward to being able to, well, first of all, does anybody believe that we are going to be in a position to do that, to, to monitor all scales 24-7? I think that there's a lot more that we could be doing that we're not, and it will depend on, this is John again, um, a couple of assumptions that we make, and, and I'm very, again, here's another question I pose to the group. If I think about a commercial site on the order of tens of years, let's just take 20 years as an operational lifetime once we actually get to operations. Um, I'm working with the assumption that people and boats are too expensive over long term given the types of resolutions that people would like in their measurements over both space and time. So is it reasonable to say that we're going to probably move more toward remote sensing supplemented with some direct sampling as our mainstay. Does that, does that seem like a reasonable assumption moving forward if we're working towards a raise at, at commercial scale? My inclination is to say yes. Let's hear from some other people. Yes, this is Ginevra. I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. As, as John says, the cost of people and boats is too high and the coverage as well, um, the time taken for the coverage. I do see remote sensing as being a way forward. Coming back to the question of how quickly things grow, I think with people going for the easier, in inverted commas, markets where there are higher, higher electricity costs, we probably will be getting the community scale first. So we'd be looking at smaller arrays of four or five devices or 10 devices before we get to the large scale covering 
tens of square kilometers. So hopefully we have a chance to develop what's working and what isn't. I mean, that in itself is a step change from what we're doing now in that monitoring one device itself has its complications. But then broadening that out to four or five devices will be looking at that slightly larger scale, spatial scale. Um, and then I should imagine that will continue for a few years before we get to the hundreds of devices, just because I don't think anybody is ready to accept that from a, a, a policy perspective, as well as from a technical perspective yet. Um, Oh, good afternoon, all. It's it's Sue Barr from Open Hydro here. I, I just wanted to comment um, particularly on the scale of development from a technological perspective. Um, I think if we're only seeing small-scale, community-led projects in the near future, then we have very little hope for a tidal technology industry in particular. There's a real need to deliver technology at scale to drive down the cost of energy. And a key cost is that we're seeing, and one of the costs we are seeing, is, is around this um, temporal and spatial scale monitoring requirements. So the much bigger requirements for, for larger scale projects. Um, we do have several hundred megawatt projects in development. We have one consented, um, and we have others likely to be consented very soon. Um, they will have monitoring requirements attached to them that will be particularly onerous and probably sit within a, a sort of um, very precautionary approach. I think the need for remote monitoring that can answer all of the questions um, posed here is really, really important. So I think there's a balance. I think if we if we only get small scale projects that are, are community scale off grid supplying into into areas with, with high electricity costs, there is um, a, a chance that you won't see larger scale development. For technologies like our own, we need bigger developments to drive down that cost of energy and make us competitive with other forms of energy production. So really, really critical. And one of the key issues that we're we're facing in terms of a sort of gated development, which is absolutely correct, is this idea that we cannot understand at a temporal and spatial scale our impacts on the broader environment. So I think there's a real importance here for remote sensing that is cost effective and that can answer those questions. How we develop that is one of the challenges I think we should be looking at. Great. You... That's great to hear from a developer's perspective there. Yeah, go ahead. Come on. Sue, for your um, large-scale development that you've already got consented, is one of the conditions to do it in a phased approach? So you're only putting in a certain number before you, you put in further ones? It is, yes. Yeah. I mean, we have some projects that are looking at a phased development, some that are open to. And, and phased development is something that um, lends itself to the types of projects we develop. So by that, I mean it makes sense economically from a tidal technology perspective. If you're only producing a number of machines per year, you would naturally have a phase development. But in some of the projects that we are um, looking at developing, you would have, um, a, say, a 30 megawatt um, uh, uh, delivery of project, which would then be monitored, um, and your, the rest of your project would be contingent on the monitoring results. We do have one project where that isn't the case. So it depends on the receiving environment and also on the, um, on the baseline data that you have and the strength of that data to make assumptions in terms of impact. So it, it's a bit of, of both worlds. And where there are unknowns, which are generally because there is a lack of good baseline data, we will be asked to monitor. Now, a 30 megawatt array of 16 meter diameter, 2 megawatt rated turbines, I would say is a fairly large scale project um, in terms of the space that it will take in terms of electricity production and in terms of cost. So meeting the needs of a project at that scale will be very different to something like a 250 kilowatt turbine development with a, a few small devices in a, in a very uh, um, contained area, for example. Yeah. yeah. Good point. So Sue, can you share with us um, for the larger project you're talking about, have there been monitoring requirements placed on you to date? And if so, will will you would that be focusing on one or two turbines and extrapolating or do you anticipate being asked to monitor every turbine 
I I suspect that there will be um, a number of a number of things happening. Um, so we haven't got to the point where we've got a, a very detailed monitoring plan for a number of turbines. So um, as you would all be aware, at Force we're monitoring the turbine, single turbine that we have in the water there. Um, at other sites we'll be looking at doing, I suppose, larger scale monitoring, um, and that's yet to be determined um, on the level of of impact and on on what needs to be understood. Um, I suspect that we'll be, and we're looking at um, fairly large areas, that we will, we will not be, we'll be looking at some impacts on, on a single turbine basis and other, uh, other sort of routes, pathways for impacts on, on a larger scale basis. Um, and we're constantly trying to build up this kind of repository of information. So if we've got a single turbine in the water, we're generally monitoring um, and we're hoping to be able to build that out. But I think it's a, it's a real unknown at the moment. And I think the reason that it is so unclear is because we don't we don't have the mechanisms or the methodologies for, for understanding the data that we need to collect. Um, we don't know how we're going to be able to do it. We don't know if we're going to have the equipment to do it. So it's all to be determined at the moment. Great. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. Um, John or Nate, do you want us from the development perspective, do you want to say anything about what your thoughts are going forward, the, the sort of the phase development uh, small arrays for a period of time, then going to larger. What are your thoughts on that? Jonathan Colby with Verdant Power. I'd be happy to say a few things. Please. Uh, I, I guess first, um, you know, as we were licensed for an array of machines, um, part of our license was for a phased build out um, to enable some of that understanding at three turbines versus 12 turbines versus 30 turbines. Um, and so, you know, I think at least in the U.S., from our perspective, that requirement is already in place. Um, and, you know, we talk about scales, um, and I, Verdon has sort of proposed three terms to describe those scales. Um, the sort of micro scale, which is in and around a single turbine, the sort of meso scale, which is inside of the array through multiple turbines, and then the macro scale, which would be large-scale sort of ecosystem impacts from energy extraction uh, beyond the sort of micro-scale turbine-to-turbine -turbine interaction. And in our FERC license and in our sort of phased approach, we include monitoring at each of those three scales using tools that are specific to each of those three scales. And so when we look at the micro scale um, on the single turbine, you know, we really think that that's mostly been resolved um, and that the significant data we've collected shows that the risk of individual sort of strike or impact at a micro scale level is very low. And then moving towards the meso and macro scale, um, we apply, you know, the appropriate tools to measure impact at those scales. Um, and, you know, I think one example in the New York area has been the detection of tagged species, which is a very useful tool at the macro scale. Um, and then depending on how you deploy arrays of those receivers, you can get pretty useful mesoscale information uh, in terms of tracking fish movement through arrays. Um, so I do think the tools are out there. I definitely would add one note that I, I don't think monitoring each turbine is a necessary requirement or should be considered as such. Um, you know, I think performance from a sample of machines in a large array is a useful way to characterize the impact of the whole array. Thanks, John. That's that's helpful. I, I think John is going in the direction that I would assume is going to become reality, that no one, no developer will be able to sustain monitoring around every turbine or WEC in, and ever actually move forward as an industry. One thing to note here, I think it's important that when John was burdened, uh, that the major interactions of concern are fish. And I think when Sue was talking about uh, open hydro and many of the sort of more open ocean devices, more frequently, the first concern is around marine mammals. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, and I would agree on the different scales, um, you know, the micro scale. 
we're sort of finding um, ways and technologies to, to answer questions. There are still some big gaps, particularly at species level identification. So where you have a species that is um, internationally protected or of high risk um, to the population, we're certainly starting to understand at that micro scale, um, but certainly from from the the larger scale, um, that there are issues, and and the marine mammals at the micro, meso, and macro scale, is a is a real issue for for our kind of turbine. So, from some of the researchers on the line, what are your thoughts about this idea of looking at one turbine? Let's start with the the very tight end interactions, micro scale, if you will. What are your thoughts about um, being able to really resolve these kinds of uh, process interactions, if you will, at that scale and then extrapolate that to the larger scale? Obviously, there's risks involved. And what about the difference between thinking about fish and marine mammals? Any, anyone got thoughts there? Uh, yeah, this is Jason Wood again. Um, I, I, I guess, Andrea, you know, I, I think it is um, – my my thoughts on it are, are yes, you know, micro scale monitoring around you know one or a few turbines seems to be the only thing that is going to be economically feasible and and perhaps feasible in other ways as well. Um, there, there, you know, monitoring is going to going to be well, it's likely to have to occur at the meso and macro scales as well. And 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 I think the 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 the, the way forward and or the challenge is tying that meso or in macro scale monitoring to the micro scale. So, you know, if you're looking at, say, you know, marine mammals or, or fish, you know, in terms of density at these larger scales, um, uh, we need to find ways to, to tie, uh, you know, tie the, the measurements at, at those larger scales to uh, make predictions at the micro scale that are informed by the monitoring at the micro scale. I'm, I'm not sure if that makes any sense whatsoever. Um, I, I guess I'd also go back to uh, John Horn's uh, earlier comment about actually defining what we're talking about. Um, the, the, what you know, all of us talking about micro, meso, and, and macro um, may uh, may may have very different thoughts about what that means, and that may vary by device size and or um, uh, receptor. Mm -hmm. Very good point. A and clearly, the questions you are asking at the these different scales differ. When you get to the to, to this sort of larger far field or macro scale, as far as animals are concerned, you're really talking about whether you're disturbing the natural movement of the population, right? Yeah, you, absolutely. But I guess what I'm trying to argue is that that if if you're disturbing the natural movement of the animals at these larger scales, that has direct impact on their their likelihood of of, of strike risk. Um, so, so I, I guess that's what I'm trying to uh, fumble towards is that is is we need to find uh, a link to help us, uh, you know, at those those larger spatial scales. We need to find a, a link that that helps us then better predict uh, by using what we have learned or are learning at the micro scale to um, extrapolate beyond just the turbine that that is being monitored in that array for the strike risk. Great, very well put. Other thoughts? I'd like to redefine a couple of things. This is John Horn. Um, I'm listening. I get uncomfortable a little bit when I start to hear the word extrapolate. And I think that arises from, uh, with all of the energy, our research energy, focusing on single devices and, and device animal interactions or strike interactions, that has arisen largely due to species of special status, as Sue has already pointed out. We haven't explicitly, Andrew, you mentioned it once, but we haven't explicitly started talking about population effects or impacts. And I, in thinking about it, I find myself associating uh, animal device interactions with individuals. And when I start to think about arrays and, and commercial sites, start to think about potential population effects, whether it be direct as maybe strike or indirect, if you want to call it, for avoidance and migration routes or um, disrupting spawning times or places. And I'm not convinced at this point, and I'm listening very hard, is it 
appropriate to think that we can truly extrapolate from observations at a single device to that of a population um, if we're talking about uh, different metrics that we'll be using to, to measure impacts. Really good point, John. And this is one of those sort of brass rings that I think we all recognize is needed and are all a little uncomfortable about, that we don't have good means of going from individual to population. And I know that this is very much driven nationally, the way things are done here in the U.S. versus places in Europe. Um, did somebody from Scotland want to say a little bit about how you think your regulators are making these jumps from individual to population? Andrew, this is Jason Wood again. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not stepping in for our Scottish colleagues by any means in this case, but I just wanted to, I guess, um, um, just just react a little bit to to, to John's um, previous comments. I, I think it, you know the irony is that in in, in some ways the 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 micro scale uh, monitoring, um, I guess, in some ways, it makes it easier. Actually, uh, the, the impacts that we're worried about there are collision risk, and I, I guess I would argue that that is easier to scale up uh, to population level effects than, say, um, the the meso or micro scale uh, uh, phenomena that we're looking at in terms of uh, displacement around a turbine. And I, and I guess the analogy that I would use is is uh, trying to um, trying to predict uh, population level effects from, say, shipping the shipping industry, right? So the, the analogy there is that um, there is a strike risk with with ships and and uh, marine mammals, and um, if you can accurately predict the the strike risk, you could argue that that is actually easier to scale up to the population level effects than, say, a behavioral response from the noise. Uh, because it's it's a it's a, it's a much clearer um, and um, we'll call it a, a larger amplitude uh, impact, right? There's the potential for for death from a a, a strike risk, um, not in every case, but but in some cases. But the, so the link is is clearer there. Whereas a behavioral response, um, there's uh, there's a lot more links in that chain to go from uh, and therefore unknowns to go from a a behavioral response or a short-term or small-scale displacement to um, linking that to a population le level effect. So there is this, I guess, trade-off between um, the, the the difficulties that we'll have at different scales and in bringing this up to a population level effect. This, this is Sherry at, at PNNL. Um, yeah, I I uh, I agree with what you're you're saying, Jason, and I think I would, I would take that as meaning we need to look at the, the population uh, scale effects as well and not just try to extrapolate or scale, you know, individual interactions to, in order to understand population effects because I'm not convinced that that is really the right thing to do. And I think until we actually have a better understanding, we need to monitor, I think, more at the population um, population effects because that's, that's going to ultimately be the, the significant effect. Yeah. Um, hey, Gail, do you mind saying a little bit, because I think you're one of the few people who have actually done this, tried to look at the close encounter risk, as well as try to get a handle on the populations of fish you were looking at, and maybe say a little bit about how successful you think that's been. Um, I guess I'm sitting here thinking about if we're really talking, I think in some cases we're really talking about populations, and in some places I think we're talking about assemblages or groups of different individual species that might be together, which is more along the lines of what we've done so far. So we may not have looked at individual species and been able to extrapolate or make suggestions to a wider population of a certain species, but thinking about the numbers of and densities of fish in an area 
more broadly speaking. So from a, an assemblage perspective, you may want to say. Um, so we certainly have done things like thought about the densities of fish and what that's related to in terms of the number of individuals we may have seen next to a turbine, but definitely, you know, direct extrapolation, not so much, <laughs> more of um, uh, thinking about, you know, what does it mean to overall density? Great. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, Gail. Um, so I'm sure we, you know, I think that what Jason and John are talking about for some places, you may be able to get to that species level and extrapolate up to the to the population, but certainly that's not exactly what we've been doing. Would it be fair to say that, um, as somebody mentioned, I think it was Jason, where we're really focused is on these animals of special status, mm -hmm. and we really do think about the individual, not only because the individual is what interacts directly with a turbine, but also because in many cases we worry that the loss of one or more individuals may affect the population. Mm -hmm. We may need to be looking at population level in two different ways. One being where there are worries about individuals because of populations under stress, and the other, as Gail has pointed out, we may be looking at these broader populations living together in assemblages and trying to understand whether there is potentially effects on those populations from the presence of the turbines, which suggests to me much longer term, bigger area of monitoring. And that's a very tough thing to get at because of the natural variability, right? Uh, from a, I don't, I think people get scared when you start to say longer term, and, and it, it, it's definitely going to require effort. Sorry, this is John Horn here. I think <clears throat> I I would kind of conceptualize it. How would how would you tackle this problem? And, and I'd be very interested to hear about thoughts from developers and what they're being potentially told to do by regulators and what people are thinking about doing for their next proposal or however it, it falls out. But are there – there's two issues. One is – um, if you're not monitoring every device, you're going to have a smaller number of monitoring packages, hopefully, than you do of devices. How to figure out how to place those, both in their density and coverage. And then secondly, given that you've got multiple data streams from one or more sensors on each package, one of the problems that I think that we haven't spent much time on yet uh, is how do we interpret multiple data streams? Do we think of it as adding to pieces of a puzzle for the entire domain of the area which we're monitoring? Or are they, <clears throat> if, we've a, if we've placed those sensors so that they are, we assume that they're not autocorrelated, they're, they're independent measures, do we use them as independent metrics? And I, I haven't heard any discussion um, in these areas. I'm very curious about anybody's thoughts. We touched on some of this the last time we talked, and I think it's an incredibly important topic, John. Um, does anybody want to give a quick thought about that? I suspect we need to devote considerable more time to this than we probably have today. Maybe the we need to we talked a little bit about that in standardization quote unquote last time, but maybe we need to get back to addressing this problem and another time because it's incredibly important and incredibly complex. Agreed. Sorry um, about that. I wasn't able to join in last time. No worries, John. No no worries. It's a great it's a great topic. So Anna or uh, Melissa, do you want to say anything about the monitoring in uh, around force? Um, in terms of sort of the sort of near field and far field and what you think we can actually be be getting out of this. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, great, sorry, it's Melissa. I had some troubles unmuting here. Um, honestly, I think at first I, I would defer to, uh, to both Gail and to Jason, uh, who are running our fish and uh, marine mammals programs in uh, the midfield, which is forces responsibilities. Um, we, 
are uh, midway through some programs right now with them, uh, coming towards the end, actually, and uh, hopefully we'll learn some more there. Um, in terms of uh, the near field at our site that is directly uh, looked at by developers, um, but uh, on our midfield work, I, again, I would defer on fish and mammals to, to Gail and to Jason right now. Uh, and I don't know if you have anything to add. Hmm. We, we only have one turbine in the water right now, and, um, you know, the focus has really been on trying to get more information and uh, really, I guess, really in that sort of pencil scale, if you want to call it. Um, uh, yes, uh, Jason and, and Gail can speak to those things. We also have uh, sensor platforms uh, in, in the forest, uh, crown lease area, that will provide uh, additional information on the on the, you know, in terms of characterizing the sites, uh, particularly for for fish. Um, right now, uh, there are not uh, lots of discussions going on about um, monitoring for multiple turbines. We're, we're not really at that stage right now, but um, certainly that's going to be a discussion. I, I, I liked um, um, John's questions. I've been thinking myself about what what do you do with an array in terms of monitoring? How do you make those decisions about which turbines would you would you monitor, which ones you wouldn't, based on how they're placed and and looking at all of that? I think that that's that's really quite quite tricky business. I think Anna actually brings up a, a good point: is that we are only talking about right now in the immediate term at Force about. Uh, one deployed turbine in the anticipation of uh, Cape Sharp second, but uh, that's very specific to two turbines of that design as well at our site. Um, while we do have small arrays from our, our various berth holders uh, in the works, it's in the immediate term, that's what we're looking at and that's what we're anticipating. Great, thank you. So I think what I am hearing is um, maybe through negative space, we all know the big questions are around populations and population effects, but no one has a very good path forward at this point to link to those populations, certainly from a, from a data collection observation point of view. And I think we all know how difficult this even is even for stock assessments of fish or marine mammal population assessments that are done by the the, usually the national agencies. Um, so would it be fair to say that we are missing that link and what we haven't talked about yet is the whole issue of models, which is really the way we're going to have to get at these very lar long, large scale, temporal and spatial, driven by enough field data to validate them. Um, and, and I sort of suspect this is one of the even if it wasn't the way we got there, the reason we are focusing on the sort of near field, you know, micro interaction. Uh, anybody want to comment on where you think we are with the stat a status of using models as this link to the populations? Obviously, this is how the regulation is done, but do you want to comment on your thoughts there? Uh, sure. Hi, this is uh, Jeff Beezer from NOAA Fisheries. Uh, and I guess, like, when you when you take a look at these population level models that we do in the stock assessment world, um, it's it's increasingly difficult to kind of parse down certainty built into those models. Uh, looking just at kind of the east coast of the U.S. right now, there are a lot of issues with retrospective patterns that get tied into um, problems with uncertainty surrounding the data. Uh, and so, really, when you think about the potential impacts of you know, even a, a, a larger on a broader population of fish, um, it's really difficult to to picture being able to identify those impacts caused by versus the other uncertainties that are built into these models. So unless you're proposing kind of having smaller scale models built up around these arrays, I don't think it's exactly that feat about these population having some kind of parameter and a population level model. Uh, for these devices. Really, really good point, Jeff. Yep, and I think that's one of the big, the big missing links. Um, others on either the fish or the marine mammal side of thinking about this, how do we even envision getting to um, measure potential population effects? 
Hi, this is John. I'd like to share uh, just an effort that we've recently completed here. And it was a modeling effort. It was really an assessment of 11 different uh, statistical models, regression models from three different categories. The goal was with a view to populations. And what we were trying to do was to evaluate, see if there was a magic tool that could be used to uh, match pattern detect change, and potentially forecast change. We simulated data starting with our Admiralty Inlet data set and thought about three, five scenarios of change and what that would look like in a simulated data set, put those together, and then put the models to work. Um, I'm uh, sad to say that there is no single model that came out uh, better than all the rest. But what we did find, we got a lot of insight into just how the statistical models work. There, we did come up with a, essentially what we'd call a decision tree of depending on your objective, the attributes of the data, and the quantity you wanted to measure, um, what models might be best suited to, to tackle that. So we weren't trying to model the population per se. Our approach was to say, if we are looking at uh, indicators, um, that are relevant to things that we were either told to or we wanted to monitor, how can we detect a difference? And we use different techniques to define exactly what, it, what a difference was. Um, but that was uh, a result of our um, query on what tools are available to look at change and how we might detect change in a population. We've got two manuscripts that have just been submitted and they're moving along in the review process. Yeah, really helpful, John. Yeah, I think there's been some very, really good work done by John's group, probably by others, but that's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, and John, just to be clear, you were looking specifically at acoustic data, active acoustic data, acoustic targets to drive those models. That's true, although we were taking them as uh, data streams that represented normal and non-normal data. So yes, our data was active acoustic data from backscatter, just the amount of energy return stuff in the water. Uh, but we felt that um, the goal really was to look at data with different attributes, and we chose a couple of metrics that we felt represented normally distributed data and uh, very spiky or non-normally distributed data. With the idea that, say, stock assessment fish counts could also be dealt with in a similar manner. I, I think in parallel, yes, because um, if you look at longer time series for resource assessment, the idea there it's often one of the indices are relative abundances that change over time. So you're looking for trend. So in the same vein, we were looking for change in our indicator or our metric and what was the magnitude of that change, what was the variance of that change, and, and what was a good tool that we could use to track it. Great. Thank you. So um, anyone else with thoughts about how we might be trying to move our thinking from the individual? Let's, let's make the assumption we're getting really good at being able to look at, uh, observe, model, et cetera, what is happening to a marine mammal or a fish in close to a turbine or a weck. Do, what do we think is the next step? How do we really try to um, move this towards our thinking on our way monitoring? Let, let me throw one first thing in that I think we just heard. I think Anna just said. How do we think of a set of machines, be they tidal or wave, and we let's say we have five or eight machines, and we reasonably can only monitor sort of 24-7 interactions of some sort with a series of sensors on one or two. How would we make those choices as to which machines to monitor, and and how would that those data inform the rest of the machine at the, the tight, close-in level? That's sort of one set of questions, I think. Another set is, how do we begin to approach this sort of larger scale um, uh, effects uh, on populations, the sort of the displacement, uh, avoidance, or perhaps attraction? 
kinds of issues. Are those two sets of questions that we need to move down those roads to, to get towards these answers? Thoughts, changes, disputes? Ian, yeah, Mark Patel again. Um, this may be more of a, a procedural suggestion on how we move forward, but I think, um, yeah, this has been really, really useful to, to listen into, and I think what would be um, a sensible next step for me is to start to consider sort of individual flows of information in regards to different potential effects and how we move forward. I think to map out how we can take data from monitoring around a single turbine and plan what we do around arrays um, becomes probably more meaningful when we talk about specific interactions. So to start to think about collision risk and how we manage information coming through phase developments is going to be very different to how we actually plan forward for looking at something like displacement. So I'd be quite interested to get to that level of detail maybe in future future sessions, and this has laid good groundwork for that. So, sorry, may I ask, Ian, could you clarify when you, I believe you used the word placement, are you talking about placement of um, sensor packages so that they can be used almost in a dual way for both device and I always use the term domain monitoring or is placement used in, in another strategic way? Sorry, actually, um, if I didn't say it, I meant displacement in comparison to a collision oh. risk. So, yeah, uh, a different point. But yeah, just really pointing out that what we what we do as we're as we're scaling up is going to be very different when we look at different different pressures and mechanisms. But but John's point about how where do you put the where do you put the instrument packages is also very valid. Okay, yes. um, uh, I think that that we've actually burrowed into a couple of things here, and I would like to know you can drop me a line afterwards if this is still a useful sort of line of discussion. I had a bunch of other questions that I think we can actually address at later times if it's useful. Um, but I'd like to know whether this is, continues to be a useful uh, sort of uh, avenue of discussion. And if so, would trying to burrow a little further into the question of how you would make decisions about placement of packages and what individual sensors you would want to be using as you went from the single device to, let's talk about smallish to medium size arrays initially. Is that useful? Okay, I've got a sure. <laughs> well, we'll send something out because it's coming up on the hour. And um, uh, first of all, if there's another th burning thought someone has, let's hear it now. And if not, we'll send something out and, you know, sort of query, is this still a useful forum? Uh, and to move forward talking more about how one might place packages around arrays for monitoring, what those packages need to look like, which we touched on a little last time, but I think there's still considerable more uh, thought to go into it. It may differ from single devices to, to multiple. Uh, and if this still seems useful, we will... Um, we will uh, schedule another one, probably in about a month's time. So we have recorded this, this forum, and we will put it up. I will write a series of notes from them, as I have in the past. But would very much like to hear from you whether this is useful, whether you want to continue to participate, and whether this line of inquiry um, concerning moving toward the raids seems like the most pressing or the most uh, important that we might make some progress on. So yeah. I'd like to thank you very much for participating. And we will be in touch about uh, your thoughts on the usefulness of this uh, moving forward again. And also, I really would like some thoughts from people that um, we can really sort of focus around. Uh, what, what would, you know, go out on a limb, what would a placement of one set of instruments or two sets of instruments in an eight turbine or an eight WEC array look like? Okay, well that said, I guess we will uh, terminate this for today and thank you very much. I hope you all have a great rest of your day.